Pluralism and its Various Spheres by Ayatollah Muhammad Taki Misbah Yazdi Published by Islamic Education of the World Federation of KSIMC What does the term pluralism mean and in what arenas of human existence can it be discussed? Well, the word plural means more than one and manifold. Therefore, pluralism means multiplicity or a tendency towards multiplicity. A pluralistic tendency is one which is related to monistic predispositions and an affinity to unity. In diverse areas of social life, we face questions such as whether production should be monopolized by one person or one group, or if it should be shared among many individuals or numerous groups. If we accept that multiple individuals or groups should carry out a certain task, then this is called pluralism. And if we accept that one individual or one group should carry out a particular task, then this is called monism. Now, the birthplace of the word pluralism is the West. In the past, if an individual who worked in the church held a number of positions, or if a person believed that one could, in theory, hold multiple positions within the church, then that person was called a pluralist. However, today in the cultural arena, a pluralist is said to be a person who in any particular intellectual sphere, whether it be political, religious, artistic or otherwise, accepts all of the available methods of action which are within that specific domain. This tendency is the opposite of the belief in a monopoly, that is, the belief that there is only one method or one school of thought which is valid and that all of the other methods are invalid. Pluralism comes up in a variety of areas, and in each of them, sometimes it means accepting plurality and different opinions in practice, meaning to coexist peacefully with one another, and to respect and allow one another to comment and share their opinion. This is what is meant by practical pluralism. It is sometimes used in the sense of theoretical and scientific pluralism, meaning that we hold true all of the different views in politics culture, economics, or religion, or that we hold that all of the opinions re represent some part of the truth, the haq, and that one path or thought pattern is not the exclusive pure truth, and all of the others are false, or batil and erroneous. Now in the past, when societies were not as expansive as they are today, and their interactions with one another was limited, something which today is known as pluralism was not even discussed. But today, with the development of societies and widespread communication between them, the issue of pluralism has been raised, especially after the intensification of sectarian and religious conflicts and their devastating consequences, as this, had led to the, as this has led to the decision that the beliefs of others have to be acknowledged and that people need to enter into reconciliation with one another. This has been done as civilization has realized that the betterment of human society lies in bringing together the different religions and schools of thought. The basis of pluralism lies in the practical dimension of peaceful coexistence. Therefore, they recommend that the multitudes in society need to devote their energies to reforming the self and living together peacefully, instead of living a life of strife and friction. Now, this is not to say that all groups need to consider each other as being right or on the truth. Rather, it means that everyone must accept the existence of plurality as a fact of life. However, this does not conflict with the fact that each group considers itself to be on the right path and the others to be on the wrong path. In regards to the theoretical and scientific aspect of pluralism, it requires that a human being must not be strict absolutist, and fanatical about one particular thought pattern and consider it 100% correct and the only truth. In fact, what is required is a return to some type of skepticism in the epistemological dimension, the concept of religious pluralism. What does the term religious pluralism even mean? Well, the term religious pluralism is sometimes raised in the theoretical and intellectual dimension and sometimes in the practical dimension. Religious pluralism in practical terms means respecting the beliefs of other people and any religion which they believe in and living together peacefully. A pluralist, therefore, 
is one who believes that two or more types of thinking, regardless of theoretical acceptance or dismissal of it, must live together peacefully and not cause social disturbance to others. However, in contrast to this, if a person believes in the need to do away with one of the groups or ideologies from the social scene and only allow one group to practice their beliefs, then this is considered to be anti-pluralism. For example, in the case of the Catholics and the Protestants, some people say that only one of these two beliefs must rule, and therefore one must fight the other to eliminate it. However, on the basis of religious pluralism, these two beliefs, both Catholicism and Protestantism, at the theoretical level, must consider each other as being false teachings, but on a practical level they must live in brotherhood with one another. Religious pluralism in the theoretical sense means accepting the truthfulness of all religions and sects. Thus, in the example given, it would mean to accept the truthfulness of both Catholicism and Protestantism. Now this will be explained further in upcoming questions and their respective answers. Assessing Religious Pluralism in its Theoretical Dimension From the purely theoretical perspective, what does religious pluralism mean? Is this something which is acceptable within the framework of the teachings of Islam? Well, in short, religious pluralism means to accept the truthfulness of many religions. However, there are three different types of expressions and interpretations of this belief. The first one states that no religion is considered as being purely false or absolute truth, but rather that every religion has correct doctrines and false principles contained within it. The second interpretation is that the truth and the reality are only one, and every religion has a path towards that one truth. The third opinion is that religious theorems are intangible propositions, and these hypotheses of religion are either entirely meaningless, or if they have any meaning they cannot be substantiated, and thus all beliefs are considered equal, and as such an individual can adopt any religion which is to one's own liking. Now, as for the explication of the first meaning of pluralism, which we said was that no religion is considered as purely false or absolute truth, but rather that every religion has correct doctrines and false principles contained within it, the proponents of this view regard the reality as a set of components and elements, and each of these can be found within any given religion. They believe that it is not possible that any single religion can be considered as completely false and invalid, and that it would have no correct or good teachings or judgments within it, just as they believe that it is not possible for there to be a religion which has absolutely no false teachings and no instructions which go against reality. They say that, in order to prove this point, that many of the precepts of Christianity have come to be found in the religion of Islam, and thus it cannot be said that in its entirety Christianity is invalid. In addition, they claim that there are many instances in which Islam also agrees with the teachings of Judaism, and thus it cannot be said that Judaism or Islam are completely redundant. When it is seen that goodness and truths are spreading among all of the religions, then one cannot say that one specific religion is correct and another religion is false but rather one must state that all religions and denominations must be treated with equal respect and that one can choose between any of the religions. That means one can take various teachings of the different religions and integrate them, take a part of the teachings of Judaism, one part of Islam, and a part of another religion and mix them all together. Now as for the assessment of this first meaning of pluralism, the opinion is that many religions or rather all religions more or less have elements of truth contained within them, and this is a view that is, is accepted by us as well. There is no set of religious teachings which is 100% false in the world, and as such, no one can ever accept such a statement. But on the other hand, if we mean that all of the religions in the world have at least some false belief or precepts, and that we have no perfect and comprehensive religion, well, this is something that we cannot accept. Islam says that the religion of Allah and the Sharia of Prophet Muhammad is entirely correct, and with the revelation of the faith of Islam, religion reached its full potential, and that which is found in other religions, 
If it is in harmony with Islam, then it is correct. Otherwise, it is false. In no way can idolatry, animalism, etc. be the same as the unaltered monotheistic Islam. The conscience of every fair-minded human being would clearly see the dissimilarities which exist between these religions and sects and their teachings. In addition to this, Islam is a religion that openly rejects that a person should believe in some of the verses of the Qur'an and disbelieve in other verses of the Qur'an. And it states that showing bias between the teachings of the religion is tantamount to the total rejection of the entire religion. In short, we believe that Islam is completely on the right and there is no falsehood contained within it, contrary to the other religions which exist in the world today. Explication of the Second Meaning of Pluralism Now the second meaning was, the truth and reality are only one, and every religion has a path to that one truth. This opinion takes the view that the religion of truth is like a unified vertex or a mountain peak, and all of the religions in the world are approaches to that unified point. Every religion wants to guide us to that solitary truth and reach the destination, whether it takes a long path, or a short traverse, or even if the paths are similar. Thus, those who go to the mosque, the church, the temple, or those who go to their temple to worship idols, are all in essence seeking the same, solitary object of worship, which is God. Now, as for an assessment on the second meaning of pluralism, this expression is conceivably strictly as an example. Now, as an assessment of the second meaning of pluralism, this expression is conceivable strictly as an example, and the relationship between different religions cannot be seen like this. The first and foremost statement of Islam is that God is one, and the path to salvation is the acceptance of monotheism, Tawheed. So how can it be considered to be the same as the Christian way of the concept of the Trinity? How can both of these ways deliver us to the same final destination? In dealing with the issue of the Trinity, the Quran says in chapter number 19, Surah Maryam, verses 90 and 91, The heavens are about to be rent apart at it, the earth to split open, and the mountains to collapse into bits, that they should ascribe a son, meaning Jesus, to the all-beneficent one God. Can Islam and its teachings of monotheism be the same path and goal which is shared with those who believe in the Trinity? Can a religion like Islam that strictly abstains from pork and liquor end up at the same point with God as a religion that permits these things? Explication of the Third Meaning of Pluralism The third meaning that we had mentioned is that religious theorems are as intangible propositions, and these hypotheses of religion are entirely either meaningless, or if they have any meaning they cannot be substantiated, and thus all of the beliefs are considered equal and as such an individual can adopt any religion which is to one's own liking. Some positivists overreact to all of these religious theorems and consider all of them as being meaningless, while others say that it is possible that such opinions have some meaning, however they cannot be proven. Others say that it is possible that for some people it may be good to follow a specific religion, but for others it may not be the right thing or that at one particular time frame, they, the religions, are good to follow, while at other times these religions are bad to follow. Such people state that we cannot find a definite 100% understanding of the reality, meaning God, and that actually having 100% certainty about a theorem is a sign of a lack of attention and investigation of the issue at hand and other such matters. These people state that in summary, these are all a type of linguistic acrobatics and are subject to societal and individual tendencies. In fact, one of the foundations and sources of inviting towards tolerance in today's world comes from this same discussion. On a philosophical basis, some have argued in favor of religious pluralism and say that basically we have no correct religion or false religion, or one that is completely true and another which is entirely false. They go on to state that it is a mistake to apply labels such as correct and false in these matters, and mention that such statements are either meaningless or invalid, and cannot be substantiated or refuted. 
They say that, in other words, it can be stated with some degree of acceptance that all of these religions and beliefs are right, and that they all lead to the straight path. Some people draw a line between these theorems and say, that which points to the reality and exists is meaningful, and is something which can either be accepted or rejected logically, such as a statement, God is one. While statements of do's and don'ts which cannot be accepted or rejected logically, such as the statement one must be just and one must not be unjust, do not point to any reality. Assessment of the Third Meaning of Pluralism The discussion of the philosophy of positivism and the meaning of nonsensory propositions and sensationalism or rationalism in knowledge is a discussion that will have to be el- that will have to be elsewhere. The discussion of the philosophy of positivism and the meaning of nonsensory propositions and sensationalism or rationalism and knowledge is a discussion that will have to be elsewhere, but it has been covered in detail in philosophical and epistemological discussions. At this juncture, we must point out that by keeping in mind the field of education and humanities, A 100% reliance on the sensory and lack of confidence on the intellect is rejected in our point of view. We must note that the only way to verify the accuracy or inaccuracy of a statement is not only via the sensory powers and experience, rather we can also prove or reject a theorem by reason, such as mathematical and philosophical arguments. Thus we completely reject this theory. In addition, we intrinsically see a difference between the statements God exists, one should not oppress, and one must pray when compared to the statement the light of a lamp tastes sour. If the first three statements do not make sense, they should not be any different from the fourth in terms of meaning. When religious propositions are reasonable, can be analyzed, and are possible to be proven or disproven, then it is at this point that the previously stated propositions can be reviewed. God does not exist. God is one, and God is three. How can these three views be combined or considered for them all to be accurate? Is it really possible to believe all three propositions to be true on the basis of pluralism? Or is it possible to accept that all three beliefs are equally valid and valuable? Religious Pluralism in the Practical Dimension Has religious pluralism existed in a practical dimension throughout the history of Islam? The discussion on religious pluralism can take place between two groups of the same sect, or between two or more sects of the same religion, or even between two or more religions. For example, religious pluralism can be discussed between Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, living in close-knit communities with one another, or in a single geographic area or in a city. For example, religious pluralism can be discussed between Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, living in close-knit communities with one another, or in a single geographical area or in a city, such that the followers of these faiths can live peacefully with one another, without any physical altercations with each group considering themselves and their religion to be right, and the other groups and their religion to be false. And they may even engage in debate and discussions with one another. There is such a thing in Islam. The Noble Quran and the life example of Prophet Muhammad, blessings of God be upon him and his family, and the twelve immaculate imams, peace be upon all of them, have advised the Muslims to have such relationships. The unity that we have in our slogans today, in which we invite the Shias and the Sunnis to, has been in place since the time of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, peace be upon him. This individual, the sixth Imam, had recommended his Shias, his followers, to attend the daily congregational prayers and the funerals of their Sunni brethren. The sixth Imam, peace be upon him, also advised that the Shia must visit the sick people among the Sunni Muslims, and not hesitate to do whatever they can for their Muslim counterparts. Even more than this, since the beginning of Islam, the Muslim community has always been friendly and welcoming with the non-Muslims living under Islamic rule, trading, or partnering in business with one another, lending money to each other, 
visiting the sick of the other, etc. However, at the same time, each one of them, both theoretically and religiously, believed his religion and set of teachings to be the only true religion. In any case, this is one of the definite issues seen in the teachings of Islam, for which there is no doubt, and which the Muslim scholars, both the Shias and the Sunnis, accept. And they have no hesitation that peaceful living with the people of the book is something which Islam has accepted. Of course, this does not mean that the religion is endorsed. It can even be said that Islam, in the event of signing a peace treaty with the polytheists, based on a secondary ruling in Islamic jurisprudence, coexisted peacefully with them. This was seen in the commencement period of Islam in which a treaty between the Prophet, blessings of God be upon him and his family, and the polytheists was negotiated in an agreement of non-encroachment on the life and wealth of both sides. The Legitimacy of Multiple Religions and Sects Can we believe in the validity of multiple religions and sects in one time period? Well, as has been said, religious pluralism has a practical dimension, which is where Islam teaches its followers to be gentle, tolerant, and coexist peacefully with followers of different religions and even within the various sects of Islam. If we cannot say that Islam was a pioneer in this field, at least we can state that Islam is in favor of respecting the rights of various minorities, whether they be religious minorities other than Islam, or minorities of the various sects within Islam. In this respect, it suffices to reflect upon the well-known speech of the master, Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, that when he had heard about the news of the companions of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan ripping off the anklets from a Jewish girl, he is quoted as having said that if a Muslim dies of grief over hearing this news, then he is warranted in doing so. However, the point is that in dealing with this phenomenon of plurality between religions and sects of a religion, we need to ask some questions. Can we all be on the right? Is it possible to say that Islam is true and Christianity is also true? To answer this question, we must look at the content of Islam and Christianity and see whether one can admit to both of them being the truth or if we must accept that agreeing to the truthfulness of one necessarily requires us to repudiate the other. The first issue which we have in Islam is the principle of monotheism, tawhid, meaning that God is one and cannot be divided nor multiplied. Neither is he born, nor does he have any offspring. The first principle in Christianity, however, is the Trinity. Now, aside from the atypical denominations within the world of Christianity, the Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox, which are the three most eminent sects of Christianity, they all say that they have three gods, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They go on to say that the path to salvation, and in order not to suffer from the punishment, is to accept the Trinity. Much has been said and written in the interpretation of these three principles and doctrines, and with the exception of a few within the world of Christianity who regard the Trinity as something outside of the fold of Christianity, all of the other Christians accept this belief and acknowledge the divinity of Christ, or at least Him being the actual begotten Son of God. In regards to such statements, the Quran clearly proclaims in Surah Maryam chapter 19, verses 90 and 91, The heavens are about to be rent apart at it the earth to split open, and the mountains to collapse into bits, that they should ascribe a son, meaning Jesus, to the all-beneficent God. In another place in the Quran, in chapter number 4, Surah Nisa, verse 171, God says, O people of the scripture, do not exceed the bounds in your religion, and do not attribute anything to God except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, was only an apostle of God, and his word that he cast towards Maryam, and a spirit from him. So have faith in God and his apostles, and do not say God is a trinity. Relinquish such a creed. That is better for you. Indeed, God is but the one God. He is far too immaculate to have any son. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens, and whatever is on the earth, and God suffices as a trustee. 
In yet another place in the Quran, in chapter number 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 73, God says, They are certainly faithless who say Allah is the third of the Trinity, while there is no God except the one God. And if they do not relinquish what they say, then there shall befall the faithless among them a painful punishment. So with all of this evidence, does the intellect of any human being, let alone a Muslim, accept that monotheism and the Trinity are both correct and valid beliefs? One belief system says that if you do not accept the oneness of Allah, then you will not enter into the ranks of the Muslims. And the first condition for entry into Islam and the true teachings of this religion is the belief in monotheism. On the contrary, the other system teaches that until you do not accept the belief in the Trinity, you can never become a Christian. Therefore, you will not find salvation, and consequently, you will not attain felicity. There is a huge difference between these two ideologies. If we compare these two religions with Buddhism, which believes that there is no God, and there will never be a God, then we see that these beliefs, that of Islam and Buddhism, or even Christianity and Buddhism, can never amalgamate. The belief that there is a God is inconsistent with the notion that there is no God, just as believing that God is three is inconsistent with believing that there is no God. Therefore, analyzing them all together, they are closer to humor and fable rather than serious real beliefs. Also, if we look at the Sharia and the practical teachings of Islam and Christianity, we find it impossible to accept both of them simultaneously as being the truth. The religion of Islam states that eating pork is forbidden, whereas Christianity says that pork is permissible. When it comes to alcohol, in Islam we have a teaching from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, in which he states that if a sole drop of alcohol was poured into a well of water, and then from that water crops were to be irrigated, and then a flock of sheep were to graze from that land, and if any one of the sheep from that flock was to be slaughtered for consumption, that he, Imam Ali, peace be upon him, would not eat that meat. Now, contrast that position which is taken in regards to alcohol in Islam with what is seen in Christianity, in which it is said that when the priest dips the bread into the wine and puts that into the mouth of the devotee, that the bread which is given becomes the body of Christ, and the wine becomes the blood of Jesus. Given these and many other such things, can a wise person ever accept that Islam is merely one direct path to the truth, and the peak of perfection and prosperity out of many, and that Christianity is also a straight path, and that Buddhism is also another path, and so on? Multiple Straight Paths Within the teachings of Islam, Within the teachings of Islam, is it correct to believe that multiple straight paths exist to God? The belief in multiple straight paths in the interpretation of pluralism is that there are many different truths on one issue. As we mentioned in the answer to the previous question, this is by no means acceptable. According to the interpretation of pluralism and the existence of a single truth and the inaccessibility of human beings to it, the assumption of multiple straight paths to God is also wholly false. However, it can be accepted only in very limited areas, as the Muslim commentators have referred to it in their books that this is in the meaning of more than one way, subul, and not path, sirat. The word path means the principal highway, and there is no more than one such path, and this is proven by certainty. It is possible that in certain areas there are sub-paths in which there may be deviations which do not harm the actual principle of religion, but accepting these sub-paths does not mean that there is more than one straight path. Therefore, in the Quran, God considers the path as being limited to only one. However, he does mention multiple ways. For example, in chapter number 6, Surah Al-An'am, verse number 153, God says, this indeed is my straight path, so follow it, and do not follow other ways, for they will separate you from his way. This is what he, God, enjoins upon you, so that you may be conscious of God. Of course, in the context of the straight path, there are various ways, subul, which run alongside it, which is something that can be accepted, 
And we see this in the Quran where Allah says in chapter 29, Surah Al-Ankabut, verse 69, And as for those who strive in us, we shall surely guide them to our ways. And indeed Allah is with the virtuous. In this verse, the ways which are accepted are the ones which will make the path back to the main highway, which is considered as the only straight passageway to God. The motivation the motivation for religious pluralism in our Iranian society. What is the motivation behind the spread of the notion of religious pluralism in our Iranian society? For some time in the press, in publications, and lectures by some dubious individuals, religious pluralism has been promoted and emphasized, and it has been stated that the religion of Islam has good things contained within its teachings, and that Christianity and other religions also have good things contained within their teachings, and they should all be respected. These dubious individuals go on to mention that we should look with tolerance towards the religious beliefs of others, just as we would like others to respect our religious beliefs. They further mention that similar to the fact that we like to invite others to our religion, we must also ensure that we give others the right to consider their own beliefs as being valid, and that they too are given the opportunity to invite others to their belief system and their teachings should also be respected and made acceptable within the Iranian society. The motivation behind such discussions and thoughts in our society can be understood as follows. Number 1. Preventing the export of the Islamic culture and the culture of the revolution. When people believe that all opinions, religions, and beliefs are valid, then there is no need to invite others to Islam. When the words which a Christian speaks about his religion are considered as being valid, then what need is there for such a person to become Muslim? When the materialists are also considered as being on the truth, and their taste demands it, then what necessity is there for those who believe in God to invite them to believe in Him? Why should a believer in one God invite a polytheist to monotheism? Realistically speaking, why would a person invite anyone else to their religion? As a result, the revolutionary and Islamic thought stays within a certain span and eventually loses its appeal and impulses and becomes useless. Number 2. Paving the way for influence of Western thoughts and materialistic values in our Iranian society. When our religion, culture, and values are considered to be non-absolute, and we do not consider Islam as the only acceptable religion, then it stands to reason that the path to other religions and schools would be opened up for other people to follow, and thus they would eventually leave Islam. If we consider that other religions and sects are also right, then why should we not follow the ways and values of others? The outcome of the above two points is the elimination of dedication and religious enthusiasm. When religious honor and reverence, which are things which prevent the perverted and misguided thoughts and wrongs, are attacked and destroyed, then the spirit of apathy and indifference to the beliefs and sacred values, both among the youth and the individuals of the society, will begin to be lost. This is what the enemies of Islam and the enemies of the Islamic Revolution themselves are aiming for as their goal, and they are attempting to open the way for the infiltration and imposition of both the material and the Western values, and the ground for the reign of the world of disbelief and arrogance is trying to be laid through this path. The Reasons for the Notion of Pluralism What proofs do the proponents of pluralism provide to support their opinion? Well, at the outset, it should be known that the proponents of pluralism provide numerous evidences such as rational, historical, Quranic, literary, and others. Although it is not possible to address all of them here, we will respond to some of them. The proponents of pluralism point to three issues to support their views. One is pluralism in political, social, and economic matters. Two is the concept of relativity in values and three is a concept of relativity and knowledge. Now we will present a brief explanation of each of these instances. As for the first one, the socio-political pluralism. In the world today, the various countries have distinct types of governance, 
Some have monarchical, various are republics. Others are presidential, and there are yet other governments which are parliamentary. Each of them have a different way of governing their country. In the philosophy of politics, when asked which type of system of governance is better, they do not give a definitive answer, and say that each one has its own advantages and disadvantages, and its own benefits and shortcomings. Today, democracy is something which is universally accepted, and it is said that people should, through having various political parties which have different values and goals, play a role in governing. If one party always has a majority and constantly takes over the government through elections, with other parties never having a chance to govern, then this is something which is not desirable. Rather, there must always be differences of opinion, and each party needs to take the reins of the government for a period of time. In this way, party pluralism in politics is accepted today. Now, when it comes to economic pluralism, in the economic dimension, the existence of different economic poles causes the elimination of domination and subjugation by particular individuals as economic growth and development depend on the existence of def different economic powers in society. By mentioning these types of arenas, the proponents of pluralism likewise draw an analogy on the issue of religion to politics, economics, and political parties, and they come to the conclusion that pluralism is desirable in various social arenas and should be pursued and developed. Of course, the explanation that has been given in response to the previous questions about religious pluralism makes it clear that drawing such analogy, as these individuals do, is a mistake. Point number two about the relativity in values. We know that there are many matters and fields of study that cannot accept multiple views. That is to say, two or more theories cannot be rightly trusted. Matters within physics, chemistry, mathematics, and geometry fall into such a category. With this in mind, the religious pluralist should be asked, Why do you liken religion to economics and politics? Why are religion and religious propositions not looked at in the same way that physics and mathematics are reviewed and studied, in which there is no more than one answer to any one particular question? Just as the analysis of the angles of reflection and refraction is one, in which the response is either that they are equal or not equal, or when it comes to the mathematical equation of whether 2 times 2 is equal to 4 or not equal to 4, when faced with religious questions such as, does God exist or does he not exist, why do we not employ the mathematical analysis of having only one right answer in this case? For such a religious question, there is only one correct answer, and an individual cannot say that there are multiple correct answers to such a religious query. This simply cannot be accepted. The pluralists attempt to answer this by bringing up another point saying that issues of humanity, human values, and cultural issues, which also include religious ones, are intangible and have no external reality, and thus they are subject to human sensitivity. Well, we quote some examples as follows on this point. Among the different colors, which color is better, green or yellow? Is the aroma of such and such a thing better than something else? Is a specific type of food better than other types of food? Is a certain person more beautiful than someone else? Or is a certain water or climate better than the rest? Or are the customs of the peoples of China and Japan better than the habits of the people of the African countries, etc.? Individuals who subscribe to the theory of religious pluralism state that religious affairs are the same, and one cannot say for sure whether prayers facing Mecca are better, or praying facing Jerusalem? Is Islam better, or is Christianity? Is monotheism and the divine teachings better, or is the concept of the Trinity? Or is materialism the better path to choose? These and thousands of other such things depend on the habits and tastes of the people, and have no reality other than their acceptability in the eyes of the populace and what is pleasing to humanity. These things can even change over time, and a person can say that for a period of time, they liked the color green, but then later on they liked yellow for a while, and later on the color red was their favorite for a certain duration of time. 
In one society, sitting is a sign of respect, whereas in another society, standing is a sign of respect, while in a third country, bending down and then straightening up is a show of reverence. Therefore, differences and variations are prevalent in all societies and aspects of life. Point number three is a relativity in knowledge. The third pillar and another principle that is used to reinforce religious pluralism is the relativity in knowledge, which in fact is also the root of two of the most important principles of this issue. It should be noted that not only is knowledge relative with respect to the discussion of values, but principally knowledge in all fields is also relative in a way. To put it more clearly, knowledge cannot be unqualified. Albeit in some matters it is clear, while in others it is hidden and obscured. Relativity exists in the real sciences and the entirety of human knowledge. All of our sciences are related to and affect one another with the geometry of human knowledge. Due to continuous change in the different roots of sciences being in a constant state of change. Finally, we would like to add that in our society... Along with the above-mentioned matters, there are some people who have taken up Islamic and religious appearances, who have also tried to provide evidence and examples for this belief of pluralism as being ingrained in the religious concepts and sacred texts. Furthermore, in some cases, they even cling onto the literary texts and poems, the like of Maulavi and Attar, which have been mentioned in each and every single proof and evidence. However, Various points have been mentioned in response to the inattentiveness or deliberate negligence in this regards, which in their own respect have been criticized and evaluated in their suitable place. In this book, too, we have mentioned some of them. Motivations for the Emergence of Pluralism In general, what motivational factor or factors are involved in the emergence of pluralism? Well, there are two rational motives for pluralism. One is the emotional and psychological motivation, and two is the social motivation. There are some who say that it is impossible to limit the true religion or sect to strictly one which will be granted salvation, because everyone who is born in a particular country and has grown up in that system will automatically consider one's own belief system and the religion which they were born into and that path as being correct and they will believe that all other paths are misleading and invalid. This opinion is not limited to Muslims alone, or Shias, or the Imami Shias, that they consider all others as being on the wrong path. In the same way, others, non-Muslims and non-Shias, also consider others, like the Muslims and Shias, to be on the wrong path. If we were born into another nation and religion and came from other parents who are not Muslims and Shia, then perhaps we would have had another thought and way of life. Just as if a Christian or Jewish, European or American today would have been born in Tehran or Qum, they too may have had a different religion other than what they are currently following and would likely have been a Shia Muslim. Just like we would expect them, those who are not born in a Muslim family or a Muslim country, to entertain the possibility of the truthfulness of the religion of Islam and the Noble Prophet, blessings of God be upon him and his family, and to pursue its research and not fall short in these regards, we too must reciprocate and also presume that there is another path out there which is the right path and we must search for it. Why is it that we presume that just because we were compulsorily born on some point on this earth, having certain parents, for example, who are Muslims, that we automatically take for granted that we and the religion which we follow are correct? and we feel that the path which others are following is not true. From another angle, can it be accepted that out of the 6 billion people who live on the earth today, only about 100 to 200 million people, and that too if they observe the obligations and refrain from the prohibitions of the Sharia, and have not shut the door of salvation and paradise for themselves, that they are the only ones who are on the truth and destined for paradise, and that anyone else who is a non-Muslim, meaning the Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, Buddhists, Hindus, etc., and all of the non-Shia, such as the various denominations within the Sunni community, and even those who are Shia but do not believe in the twelve Imams, peace be upon all of them, such as the other groups within the realm of the Shia, that all of these are misguided, deviants, and prone for punishment and hell? 
This analysis provides a psychological impetus for some people to believe that other religions and sects can also be the truth. And therefore such people say that we are on the right, but those other people are also saved and destined for paradise. They too, in their own opinion, are on the right, and it is possible that they may actually be more honorable and purer than us, and they may actually be practicing their religion much better than we follow ours. Now from another point that has prompted this theory is the confrontation with the struggles, turbulences and domestic wars that have always existed throughout human history until today. What a great deal of devastation, destruction and bloodshed has occurred over the claims of legitimacy about this or that religion, and the intolerance and persistence of people over their particular beliefs which has gone on for so long. The war of the Crusades between the Muslims and Christians, and the sectarian wars between the Shias and the Sunnis, or the wars which have gone on between the Catholics and Protestants are all examples of this. The root of all of these conflicts and tensions is intolerance, and the insistence of people's own view over that of others. To put an end to these conflicts, we need to be a little tolerant and easy. If we all come together and say, we, meaning our religion, is the right, and you and your religion are also right, Islam is right and so is Christianity, the Shia way is right and so is the Sunni, the Catholics, the Orthodox, the Protestants, they are all right, as they are all rooted in humanity. If we believe this and subscribe to this, then all of humankind will be at peace and harmony and will all reach to a level of affability. So far, the discussion has been about these two motivating factors. Should these two motivations now be endorsed? And if so, is there a solution other than pluralism? Is there another way? If there is another way, then what is the logical and correct way to proceed? Now to answer this question which has been proposed by the intellectual motivational factor, the following two points must first be made. Point number one is that the term disadvantaged, mustadhaf, which we will use in our discourse, has at least two meanings. The first meaning are the socially and economically disadvantaged, the mustadaf, those who are the underprivileged in society. And the second meaning is the intellectually disadvantaged, the intellectually mustadaf, which in the science of theology, al-ilm al-kalam, is a reference to those who have failed to recognize the truth due to shortcomings and their own culpability in their power of contemplation. For example, they have not been able to understand the reason for the need of the existence of God or the veracity of Islam, or they have not come across these issues in their lives, and even if they had come across them and heard about God or Islam, they did not give any probability about the validity of them, and consequently they did not pursue them any further. Whether this attitude comes from the environment of the family or society, or due to a lack of information, or negative propaganda, whatever the case may be, it has led the person to take on a different path in life. The second point to keep in mind is that in its technical meaning, one who is uninformed, jahil, is divided into two types. The first type are the culpable, al-jahil al-muqassir, and this refers to a person who has access to knowledge, or considers that one's belief system may not be correct, however falls short in following up and does not seek the right path and the truth in his lifetime. This group has been remonstrated in the society and within the religious teachings of Islam. The second type of uninformed or jahil is the in inculpable, al-jahil al-qasir, and this refers to a person who is either unknowingly in a state of ghafla and does not think that what one is doing or saying is incorrect in terms of religious be beliefs and ideologies. And if there is a possibility that one knows that what they are doing or saying in terms of the religious outlook is not permissible. But if that person was to see or hear things guiding one to the truth, then they still have no means to reach to that truth. This group, the second one, the inculpable, is not from the rational or the religious point of view rebuked. Now, by keeping in mind these two points, we say the following. The intellectually weak and ignorant, al-jahil al-qasir, that is a person who really has not been able to come to terms with the truthfulness of Islam 
and Shiism is excused and discharged of this responsibility. Although one is mistaken and the belief system is not correct, because the truth cannot be two, so either God exists or he does not exist, either Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him and his family, is the seal of the prophets or he is not, and a combination of these is the amalgamation of two contradictions which is impossible. However, we would not consider such individuals to be worthy of the punishment and hell. And indeed, a majority of the people of the world fall into this category. If one fails to recognize the truth due to one's own laxity, or one recognizes the truth and still decides to go against it, then both the intellect and the law of Islam would consider such a person as deserving of punishment, and every person deserves to be punished as much as one is guilty. A clear evidence of this opinion is contained in a portion of the supplication of Qumail, in which Imam Ali, peace be upon him, has been quoted as saying to Qumail, But you, O Allah, holy are your names. You have taken an oath that you will fill hell with the unbelievers, both with the jinn and humanity together and that you will place those who stubbornly resist therein forever. Therefore, a person who rejects faith and is a disbeliever, and is not traversing the path of truth, is considered as one who was culpable in his actions, and will enter into hell. However, as for those who will reside in the punishment for perpetuity, it is those individuals who are the people of obstinacy and stubbornness in regards to the truth. Another point to keep in mind is that within the discussion on religious pluralism, it is not about what city and country you and I were born into, or which parents we were given to, or where we grew up. Rather, the discussion is centered upon the fact that amongst the various and even contradictory views, from an epistemological and real point of view, no more than one opinion can be correct. So what will happen to the dissenters of the truth? Well, this is another matter which we have already discussed. As for the social motive of, of avoiding war and bloodshed, it should be said that these matters were not and do not legitimize different and contradictory claims. Categorizing the thoughts of others to be either true or false, or right or wrong, is a human action and is among our mistakes. It is not possible to bridge one to the other. But there is a way to avoid unnecessary wars and bloodshed that Islam has followed in the best possible way. As an explanation to this point, we can state the following. Those who are not the followers of the twelve Shia Imams are divided into several different groups, and they have separate rulings related to them. The various Shia and Sunni sects that are classified as being Muslims, and other than a limited number of them, such as the Nawasib, those who vilify and show malice to the fourteen infallibles, peace be upon them all, who share in the same beliefs as the Imamiya in the principles of God, religion, the book meaning the Quran and the necessities of religion, they all fall under the Islamic verdict as being regarded as Muslims and are entitled to all of the rights as such. And among all of these sects, the faith of Islam has never permitted for there to be any war or conflict between them, that is between the Shia and the Sunni. The second ruling is in, in regards to non-Muslims, or those who are Jews, Christians, or Zoroastrians. Those who are commonly known as the people of the scripture, or the people of the book, Ahlil Kitab. These are groups who are contractually protected under the Islamic system, and their lives, property, and honor are sacrosanct, and just like Muslims are obligated to pay taxes, such as Khums, Zakat, and other religious dues, that they, the people of the scripture, are also required to pay some kind of tax on government and military services, known as the jizya. Islam has never advocated that preemptive war be enacted on these individuals. The third group are those who are not followers of one of the heavenly revealed teachings. However, they have entered into a treaty with the Islamic government. This group is permitted to live in the Muslim regions. Rather, they live in the Muslim inhabited lands following their own ways and customs through a bilateral agreement. In such an understanding, both parties must act according to that which has been ratified, which would be unique to each group living in such a system. In the case of this group as well, there must be no conflict initiated by either side. 
The fourth group are those who have either never held a covenant or agreement with the Muslim government, or they had made agreements in the past but violated them. These rebellious people are not tolerable in any government and system, and they must be subdued by force and power and fought into submission to the state and the laws, or they must be removed from that region. This principle is seen in all systems of the world, and no healthy government will, will allow for the pilfering and violation of the rights of others, and thus will have to deal swiftly with such acts of criminality. Alongside the aforementioned points, the logical and rational religion of Islam always invites the opposition to discuss and debate, and it states that we the Muslims are people who engage in discussion and conversation, and have a clear position that if you can persuade us, and prove to us the truth of your path, then we will stop talking about Islam and join you. However, if we can prove to you that we are right, then you must come and join us. Even more than this, the religion of Islam says, if you do not submit to logic and the truth, then at least let us live by a shared agreement and not shed the blood of one another. If you do not want to, then you do not have to accept our religion. Ultimately, however, if one does not accept logic and the truth, and refuses to live in peace under an accepted agreement, then every unbiased observer will have to admit that there is no choice but a physical confrontation. It is not enough for one party to not quarrel in the conflict. Rather, one group must do all that they can to prevent aggression and war with the other party. Therefore, the correct way is not to say that everyone is on the right path. Rather, only... Rather, one can only consider oneself as being on the right, and in reality it is only one group within a group which is on the truth. However, with that said, we will never engage in hostility or war with others, 